I'm very honored to chair uh, the keynote lecture of Professor Vivian Liska from the University of Antwerp. Uh, I met Vivian for the first time maybe seven years ago when she invited me and my wife to speak at the uh, Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Antwerp. And I also discovered this very beautiful city. Um, Vivian Liska is uh, studied in Antwerp and is professor there of German uh, and uh, uh, comparative literature. And she is uh, running the, there the Institute of Jewish Studies, who's, which have been, has been very active for many years. And since nine years, uh, she's been distinguished visiting professor of German at the German literature at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And uh, I think that uh, a very large community of students and colleagues uh, in Jerusalem have been able to gain so much from her presence here. Uh, she has worked on, uh, among others, on Paul Celan and Elsa, Elsa Lasker Schuller, on Walter Benjamin, Kafka, Arendt, Agamben, Blanchot, Adorno. Uh, as you see, she's, uh, she's very multiform in her gifts. She will speak today. She has been kind enough to agree to give the lecture, the keynote in memory of Bernd Witte in Dialogue with the Dead. Vivian. You were sitting there previously. The floor is yours. My sincere thanks to the organizers and particularly to Paul Mendes Floor for the generous invitation and the unlikely honor to deliver today's keynote lecture. I say unlikely because I'm not a Bubo scholar and generous because it gives me the opportunity to pay tribute to the one who was supposed to give this lecture and in whose memory I'm speaking here today. It is indeed an honor tinged with sadness. Bernd Witte, with Paul, the editor of the Martin Burbur Werkausgabe, the completion of which is celebrated here at this event, died after a short, violent illness on April 1st, 2022, a few days after his 80th birthday. Bernd Witte was a prominent scholar and teacher of German literature, a committed critic of cultural and intellectual developments of our times, and mainly in the last decades of his life, a pioneer in the field of modern German Jewish literature and thought. He was keenly aware of his historical situation as a German of the immediate post-war generation and took upon himself the responsibilities he felt this incurred. He was a loyal colleague, an attentive listener, a generous interlocutor, and a public speaker with an old-fashioned gravitas and poise. He was also a devoted mentor, an upright intellectual, and a seeker of what counts and matters. He was my close friend for over 20 years. The title of my talk, In Dialogue with the Dead, should really be in quotation marks, as it is not only inspired by this occasion, but is a direct quote gleaned from the one remembered here. And let me quote some of Bernd Witte's words to this effect. I will read it in German, and you have the English translation on the screen. Erinnerung ist ein Dialog mit den Toten. Die Texte der Toten zum Sprechen zu bringen, ist seit jeher ein literarisches Anliegen. Sätze, die angesichts der drohenden Vernichtung nicht nur des historischen Subjekts, 
sondern der europäischen Kulturtradition in ihrer Gesamtheit geschrieben sind, konstruieren das Geschichtsverständnis nach Maßgabe der Lektüre, die den vorgegebenen Text je neu vom jeweiligen historischen Augenblick, von der aktuellen Krise her liest, Geschichte wird so zum Dialog mit den Toten. Das Gespräch mit den Toten ist ebenso wichtig wie das mit den Lebenden. Erinnerung in der Schrift heißt den Dialog mit jenen aufnehmen, die vor einem geschrieben haben. Denn immer ist es die von der individuellen Erfahrung getränkte Sprache des Dichters, die als das Medium des Gesprächs mit dem Gegenüber des Du, des Gesprächs mit dem eigenen Ich und des Gesprächs mit den Toten fungiert. Geschichtsschreibung im Modus der Textgeschichte vollzieht sich als Dialog im Entzug. Für sie ist das Verfahren des Talmud das kanonische Vorbild, in dem das Gespräch mit Gott und den Toten, den beiden gleichermaßen unzugänglichen Partnern, ins Werk gesetzt wird. Historiography in the mode of textual history takes place as a dialogue in withdrawal. What does this mean? When we read and write and, in our writing, read anew the canonical texts of the tradition, endangered by the inexorable progression of time and the imperative of the new, when we comment these texts from the changing vantage point of our respective historical moment, we engage in what Bernd Witte with striking frequency and in the most diverse contexts calls a dialogue with the dead. This dialogue, Witte insists, attempts to save the historically defeated from the political enemy from which, in the words by Walter Benjamin, whom Witte quotes, not even the dead are safe when he wins. When the enemy wins, and this is also, though not only Benjamin's enemy when he wrote these lines, in 1939, when the enemy wins, the voices of the dead are distorted, abusively appropriated, and ultimately consigned to oblivion. Deprived of the memory of the dead, we, the living, are bereft of what in turn could have saved us, precisely the dialogue with those who came before us those who allow us to enter into a diachronic conversation and an imaginary community of receptive and creative companions established through the centuries. This dialogue with the dead was at the core of Witte's hermeneutic endeavor and at the heart of his legacy as a reader of texts from the Bible to Buber, from Goethe to Paul Celan. Calling reading and more generally the confrontation with figures from the past a dialogue obviously cannot be but a metaphor. A dialogue, after all, requires two individuals addressing each other. The metaphor is nevertheless suggestive. Since the dead cannot speak, the living address the dead in a way that takes upon themselves the responsibility of not silencing the deceased of listening to what the absent would have said if they still had the power of speech, or at least to try. It prohibits projecting one's own views and ideas onto those who can no longer speak. It thus requires from the living to make space for listening to the absent other. To speak of a dialogue of the dead, however, also implies that the living consider themselves personally addressed by the text that reaches them as a voice of the departed. Arguably, this is only possible with texts that have the power to speak and to speak differently to each of us in a specific singular way. This happens most commonly in canonical texts, and maybe this is one of the main definitions of the canonical. It also paradigmatically corresponds to the inherent hermeneutic premises of the Torah and its exegesis. In the well-known Psikta 12, we read that, quote, the voice of God speaks according to the specific capacity of each and every one, 
and is nevertheless the one God. In the same way, the canonical text remains itself even as it addresses each reader in a singular way. Witte suggests as much in a text on Kafka when he writes, quote, wie die Torah, die nach Auffassung der Kabbalisten jedem Leser ein eigenes Gedicht zuwendet, so auch die Schrift, wenn sie gelesen und kommentiert wird. Like the Torah, which according to Kabbalists turns its own face to each reader, so does literature when it is read and commented on. In the context of this conference, in the context of this conference, the obvious question arises. How does this hermeneutics as dialogue with the dead, conjured by Bernd Witte, relate to Buber's dialogic philosophy? In light of Buber's idea of dialogue, the notion of a dialogue with the dead, taken in a narrow sense, might seem like an oxymoron. After all, Buber insists on the living presence of two speakers mutually engaged with each other. Buber's conception of dialogue does point to a necessary distance, ein Zwischenbereich, an in-between separating the two interlocutors, but what separates the living and the dead is an incommensurability that transcends the requirements of a dialogue in Buber's sense, presence, reciprocity, and availability to listen and to speak, to take in and to respond. The oxymoron, however, also suggests that talking about a dialogue with the dead in light of Buber's thought performs the reciprocal bond between them as an as if, so that the voice of the dead emerging from the departed author's text is transformed from an it to a thou, from a lifeless utterance to a living voice. Buber himself addresses this transformation in terms that encompass a dialogue with the dead. In his postfast to Ich und Du, he speaks of the experience of engaging with the sayings passed on by tradition of a master who died thousand years ago. Buber reflects on the transformation of the Spruch, the saying of the long dead master from being an object, ein Gegenstand, to a living presence in the reception by the reader, calling it an empfang, a reception, in which the indivisible whole of an utterance is absorbed. The speaker of the saying is not present, nicht vorhanden, but his saying is in the mode of turning towards it, in zuwenden. The dead person is at the same time alive, in the attitude adopted by the recipient of opening him or herself with his or her whole being, mit seinem ganzen Wesen, to the saying, the recipient can hear the voice of the speaker as present. Now, uh, this word as here becomes ambivalent. Is it again an as if, or the speaker, the dead one, as present? This transformation conjures both the possibility and the responsibility of the reader to grant and bestow life to the voice from the past. This occurs when, in the act of reading, one opens oneself to be spoken to, as Buber would say, in one's very being. This transformation occurs, uh, this relationship to the absent voices from the past contrasts with an antiquarian approach to texts, where such voices are, mere, are a mere it. Speaking of a dialogue with the dead thereby establishes the fragile scene of an encounter that is enacted each time anew. On the one hand, it prevents both an appropriating projection of one's own vision, an attitude that risks falling back into monologue, sameness, and the obliteration of the relation between of the relational between. On the other hand, it counters the positivist objectification of the antiquarian attitude of assembling, collecting, and archiving quotes as mere items. This requires a delicate simultaneity of speaking and listening, giving and receiving, even if 
In the absence of the interlocutor, it occurs only in one's own consciousness. In this encounter that renders permeable the threshold between the living and the dead, we share a reality with those who are no longer. We are made aware of our own limitations and our indebtedness to what was thought and written before us, as well as to our responsibility toward those who will come, think, read, and write after us. And in the sense of continuity of our commitment and our capacity, which is both a gift and a privilege to keep the voices of the dead alive. While the dividing line between the living and the dead is thereby not negated, it is nevertheless rendered porous in both directions. This permeability enables what truly deserves to be called a dialogue. For Bernd Witte, the dialogue with the dead not only encompassed the entirety of his activity as a reader, as literary scholar, but it also bore ethical, political, and existential meaning. In one of his rare, straightforwardly theoretical reflections, Witte explicitly associates the activity of reading as such with the dialogue with the dead. In the context of his elaborations on the meaning of allegory in Walter Benjamin, he writes, not only do all objects enter the written text as dead, even the subject, the author himself, is present in it, not as living voice, but as the other, the dead. Objecting to the deconstructionist Hillis Miller's dictum that, quote, a critic has to choose between a tradition of presence and a tradition of difference, Witte posits a tertium datur, a third possibility, the tradition of the present absence. Here, the reading of a text is the rewriting of an earlier one by an author who is always dead because he or she is absent. A more literal meaning of the dialogue with the dead emerges in Witte's reflections on Benjamin's associations of writing as a process that, in some ways, always occurs in the face of death. While Witte bases this insight on Benjamin's origin of the German Trauerspiel, it can be illustrated more vividly in his essay on the storyteller, where two figures perform the transmission of experience. Scheherazade, who in telling her stories postpones imminent death, and the dying man who looks back on his life. In both cases, death is the driving motor of their speaking, or is it life? But beyond this metaphorical death of the author and the foil of death haunting the living, Witte's invocation of a dialogue with the dead has a more specific reference and a more concrete and even more literal interlocutor, which brings me to the actual task and theme of my lecture. Witte's contribution to German Jewish literature and thought, the topic I was invited to speak about here. On the surface, the dead Witte addresses are the Jewish authors to whose writings he devoted most of his research. Moses Mendelssohn, Heinrich Heine, Hugo von Hofmannsthal, Walter Benjamin, Franz Kafka, Gustav Landauer, Paul Celan, and last but not least, Martin Buber. Their legacies, Witte believed, had been repressed and silenced by the Germans, not only after, but already for a long time before the war, but did quietly and discreetly, and maybe not even entirely consciously, the ultimate addressees of his endeavor were the Jewish victims of Nazi terror. With his contribution to German Jewish studies was at the center of our common preoccupations and our ongoing dialogue. In the two decades of our friendship, we discussed, debated, and often disagreed about the writings of Kafka, Benjamin Scholem, Celan, and to a lesser degree of Heidegger, Gottfried Benn, and Karl Schmidt. Witte's interpretative talents, as well as his reverence for the written word, were inspiring. In his countless seminars and lectures, he likewise read each new text as a commentary responding to a previous one, thereby layering the cultural memory of a community. At the same time, Witte was inspired by the word as sound. He repeatedly insisted on the importance of living speech and demanded that the printed word be spoken and heard in personal encounters 
in the classroom, and in academic gatherings with colleagues. Quoting Buber, he frequently underlined the role and value of das gesprochene Wort, the spoken word, and the lived encounter. But his main passion remained the literary and poetic text, its nuances and details, which he interpreted with creativity and verve, and to which he brought his immense erudition and the boundless riches of his Musée Imaginaire. The tension between orality and schrift runs as a motif through his writings, particularly in Jewish contexts where he located the origins of this complementary and enlivening distinction. I learned a lot from Bernd. He was originally a classicist. He had studied Greek and philosophy and completed his studies with a dissertation on Plato's dialogue, Carmides. He was also an expert on Goethe and the Weimar classics. His publication, Goethe, Writing the Individual of Modernism, and his edition of Goethe's collected poems are landmarks in the field. In numerous dedications in his books, he conveyed that he also learned a thing or two from me about new developments in literary theory, about the authors and texts we both loved, and last but not least, about Judaism and Jews. His scholarly work on German Jewish authors began with his Habilitation on Walter Benjamin's literary criticism titled Walter Benjamin, the intellectual as critic. His monograph on Benjamin, published by Rowold, is one of the most widely read introductions to the life and work of the thinker and is now available in many European and non-European translations, among them in Hebrew. From 2000 to 2010, Witte served as president of the Düsseldorf-based International Walter Benjamin Society, and in this function organized numerous academic events. After a first professorship at the University of Aachen, Witte taught at the Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf, where he held the chair of modern German literature from 1994 to 2010 as Dean of the Philosophy Department and Director of the Institute of German Studies, he contributed considerably to the current profile of the faculty. I first saw Bernd at the University of Antwerp, where he gave a lecture on Weimar classicism. I was, at the time, a young professor and somewhat intimidated by his appearance and demeanor of an old-style Deutscher professor. I remember noticing that he was ever so slightly cross-eyed, this squint softening his steel blue gaze. I just dared to approach him in the coffee break and we discovered our shared interest in German Jewish literature. I last saw Bernd shortly before he passed away on a Zoom meeting together with Steve Ashheim, Ashraf Noor, and Paul Mendes Floor. The few sentences Bernd could still speak at that point were words of gratitude, particularly addressed to Paul for his friendship and their collaboration on the Buber project. The completion of the 23 volumes of the Buber edition he directed together with Paul on behalf of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities was in some ways the culmination of his academic work on German Jewish authors. It expressed, though he never said so in public, his deep commitment to rescue what he called the catastrophic obliteration of the Jewish tradition in the German cultural memory. German cultural and intellectual life altogether, he often remarked, had irretrievably shrunk to insignificance after the Nazis' destruction. He made major scholarly contributions to German Jewish studies in several essays on Paul Celan, and mainly in his three last books, Jewish Tradition and Literary Modernity, Heine, Buber, Kafka, Benjamin, Moses and Homer, Greeks, Jews, Germans, Another History of German Culture, and in his last book, Martin Buber and the Germans. He left two projects unfinished at the time of his death, a collection of his essays on Paul Celan that he wanted to expand, and a book 
on the devastating consequences of the disappearance of Jewish literary life in Berlin, Prague, and Vienna. Both his published books and his unfinished projects were framed by his conviction that it was the task of contemporary German studies and of the European humanities as such to register the loss incurred by the eradication of the Jewish tradition in the self-understanding of the West and to save it from oblivion. Witte's books on German-Jewish literature and thought make big claims that some of his critics considered exaggerated or even outrageous. In the first of these books, Jüdische Tradition und Literarische Moderne, Witte argues that literary modernism ties in closely with fundamental aspects of the Jewish textual tradition, the importance of the materiality of the written word, the structures of cultural memory as transmission, and the concept of canonical texts as gradual, ever unfolding truth. So strongly does Witte argue for the affinities between Judaism and modernist literature that it sometimes indeed sounds as if literary modernism was born aus dem Geiste des Judentums. Witte supports this claim with Mendelssohn's philosophy of language, which he calls a media theory avant la lettre, and with the discussion of our highness prose ever so subtly undermines enlightenment optimism and prophetically foresees the participation of modernity in the worst that was yet to come. In his subtle interpretation of Heine's Rabbi von Bacharach, which Witte somewhat hyperbolically called the first modernist writing in German literature, he detects references to Jewish scriptures and German literature, but also to Cervantes' Don Quixote. He ends his interpretation of Heine's tale with the ominous words, the baptized Jew, the protagonist, Don Isaac, is an erring knight, ein irrender Ritter, eine lächerliche, weltfremde Figur, zugleich aber auch eine tragische, denn wie der Mann von La Mancha verkennt er mit seinem albernen, ritterlichen Gehabe die historische Realität seines Volkes, die eine des Leidens und des Todes ist. A ridiculous, unworldly figure, but at the same time a tragic one, because like the man of La Mancha, he misjudges the historical reality of his people, which is one of suffering and death. In the same book, Witte addresses Buber's program for a renaissance of Hasidism and Eastern Jewry, which Witte regarded as a late expression of the best and the worst of German Romanticism, and as exemplary expression of the irrationalism resulting from modernist questioning of the premises of the Enlightenment. He also draws on Kafka's failed search for his Jewish identity, described as paradigmatic failure of modernity gone awry. Witte's reading of the most widely interpreted German modernist text, Kafka's Before the Law, offers a surprising yet convincing indictment of Jewish assimilation and the weakness of modern Jews to access the law. At the same time, Witte reads the parable as a Talmudic agada. He sees in the patient waiting of the man from the country, the Amma Aretz, an expression of Kafka's impossible longing to become a Talmud Chacham. And in the man's glimpse of the radiance shining from the law before his death, the reward for his steadfast, hopeless hope. Bernd gave me for each of my birthdays through the 20 years one of the little volumes of the Insel uh, library, and you can see here, right, uh, the copy that I got uh, for my 60th birthday, it is Before the Law by Kafka, and next to it, uh, you can see the dedication that he wrote into it, für Vivian, die Kafka-Spezialistin, wurde dieses Buch restauriert zu ihrem 60. Geburtstag von ihrem Am Haaretz. <lacht> Jerusalem, 11.06.2016. Witte concludes with a portrait of Walter Benjamin, concludes that book uh, on the literary tradition, on uh, Jewish, the Jewish tradition and literary modernity, 
with a portrait of Walter Benjamin as embodiment of the wounded legacy of German-Jewish coexistence. With its starting point in Mendelssohn's hope for the successful emancipation of diasporic Judaism and its end in Benjamin's suicide, Witte's first major book on German-Jewish literature implicitly narrates the familiar rise and fall story of Jewish intellectual life in German lands. In the hands of a careful wordsmith who chiseled with the most refined tools of literary criticism, this story regains new life, and yet its pages are imbued with the foreboding of catastrophe. This tension between rigorous readings and a sense of doom lends Witte's portrayal of the Jewish tradition in literary modernity its grandeur and its sorrow. The back cover of Moses and Homer, so his second book, Witte's most elaborate and provocative book offers both a summary and a credo. Do I have this? No, I, sorry, just listen. The Jewish tradition has been largely erased from the cultural memory of the Germans. From the aesthetic education of man to the Shoah, the book traces the development of a discourse that glorifies the beautiful human body as well as their schöpferische Mensch, the creative individual, thus leading to the suppression of monotheism and the establishment of a secular religiosity that paves the way for the folkish ideology of national socialism. In a key passage of the book, Witte asserts, Homeric history is one of murder, war, and death. Positing society as a ruthless site of struggle, German Greekophiles promoted a worldview that increasingly suppressed the Judaic affirmation of God-created life and the proscription, thou shalt not kill. Witte saw it as his task to point out how this erasure of the Jewish tradition occurred in the Hellenophile writings of Goethe, Schiller, Kant, Hegel, and Hölderlin, in Nietzsche and Heidegger. This erasure went hand in hand, or, as Steve Ashheim writes in a superb review of the book, was dialectically related to the denigration of the biblical figure of Moses. In Witte's telling, German-Jewish authors, from Mendelssohn to Buber, upholding the ethical teaching of Jewish scriptures, tried in vain to reverse this vision on the perception of their German environment. The radicalism with which Witte attacks the anti-Judaic attitudes held by the sacred cows of German culture is unprecedented. Important voices in Germany, such as the philosopher Hartmut Böhme, accuse the book of fostering a false dichotomy between killer Germans and peaceful Jews, a polarization motivated by what Böhme obviously thought but didn't spell out in so many words, a dubious philosemitism dictated by German guilt. Böhme's bitingly critical review, titled Die böse Lust an Griechenland, quotation marks, begins with the skeptical headline, Bernd Witte believes he can identify the root of racial anti-Semitism in German worship of antiquity. Böhme rejects uh, Witte's critique of the Weimar masters anti-Semitism wholesale. He does not, however, address Witte's stark evidence when he, for example, quotes Schiller, a darling of so many German Jewish readers, describing the Jews quote, unworthiness and depravity, and asserting that, also a quote, the highest degree of uncleanliness and contagious diseases became endemic with them so that leprosy poisoned its sources of life and procreation and became the Jews' hereditary tribal constitution. Schiller extends this demeaning characterization to his own present and calls the Jews quote, the roughest, the most malicious, and depraved people on earth. Interestingly, some Jewish readers too distanced themselves from what they saw as with a selective and overly idealizing admiration of Jews and Judaism, understandably. They invoked the typical arguments against non-Jewish philosemitism, that it amounts to an over-identification with Jews as well as an appropriation of the history for heteronymous agendas, or that, in operating with the, that it is operating with the same stereotypes as anti-Semitism, and with that in inevitably reverses into its opposite. 
This may explain the dire situation at Bernd Witte's retirement, at his event uh, where he gave a lecture on precisely his book, Moses and Tauber, where neither the faculty of the German department, who felt insulted by his critique of their sacred cows, nor the Jewish studies department showed up for his emeritus lecture called Germans and Jews. I myself sometimes teased Bernd about his philosemitism and the occasionally solemn tone he adopted when he talked or wrote about Judaism and Jews. He was hurt by this. Only now, reflecting on the meaning the dialogue with the dead took on for him, do I realize how the attitude captured in this notion contains antidotes to precisely whatever is wrong with philosemitism. In light of the reflections on the meaning of dialogue sketched out above, it imposes a distance in one's commitment and involvement that precludes symbiosis, appropriation, or identification. And there was indeed nothing facile in Witt's, Witte's fondness for Judaism. In contrast with many Germans of his generation, he regarded the Jewish tradition as the origin of an ethical view of the human. He was disconcerted when it was proven wrong by uh, political circumstances uh, in the past decades. He regarded the Jewish tradition as the origin of not only the Ten Commandments, but the very idea that was behind them. And he considered the Jews as a people of the book, adverse to violence and war. The preface of Wittes, Homer and Moses ends on a candid autobiographical sketch in the third person, in which he draws a portrait of himself before he encountered the Jewish tradition. And I'm going to read it in German again, and you have the English. Der junge Mann, der in den 50er Jahren vorigen Jahrhunderts ein klassisch-humanistisches Gymnasium besuchte und dort Griechisch und Latein lernte, sich für Homer begeisterte und dann wie selbstverständlich Altphilologie studierte, wusste nichts von der jüdischen Tradition. Wie Werther setzte er in ländlicher Idylle seine süßen Erbsen mit etwas Butter ans Feuer und las dabei ahnungslos und begeisterungsfähig seinen Homer. Nach einem Studium in Tübingen bei Schülern von kompromittierten Vertretern der großen klassischen Tradition in Deutschland ging er nach Paris, wo er beim jüdischen Grezisten Jean Bollac das strenge Handwerk der Altphilologie lernte. Durch ihn lernte er auch viele der Überlebenden einer deutsch-jüdischen Kultur kennen, Paul Celan, Peter Sondi, Hans Mayer und Gershom Scholem. Sie alle waren die Lehrer des unbedarften jungen Mannes, der die Welt des großen Geistes nur in der Lektüre der griechischen Originaltexte Homers, Pindars und Platons kennengelernt hatte. Die jüdischen Intellektuellen eröffneten ihm eine neue Welt. Last but not least, allow me a few words about Wittes Buch Buber und die Deutschen. I leave it to the experts here to evaluate his contribution to Buber studies, but I contend that this book too must be read as an indirectly personal dialogue with the dead Jewish philosopher. With this book is suffused with authentic reverence for Buber's role in reviving and renewing Jewish culture, for his introduction of Hasidism to German culture, for his cultural Zionism and his religious socialism. The book offers some praise for the writer Martin Buber, though his pathos and the Germanic contortions of his style often get Witte's red penciling. There is certainly respect and, appro and appreciation, but there is no love. Indeed, as Mircha Brumlik writes, the book is far from uncritical. Witte, so Brimlich writes, deals with Buber and his work with equanimity and good judgment, which matters especially in view of the fact that critical minds are still hostile to Buber. Witte acknowledges that other influential philosophers of the pre- and post-war period, like Walter Benjamin and Scholem, and last but not least Adorno in his Jargon der Eigentlichkeit, contemptuously criticized Buber's work. 
Witter too demonstrates the extent to which Buber, especially in his early stories dedicated to Hasidism, such as Daniel, which we have heard quoted before, was decisively influenced by the offshoots of German late Romanticism. Witte too highlights that Buber, in his attempt to shape an independent cultural Zionist identity, increasingly adopted, quote, the ideas and concepts that were prevalent in the German discourse of his time. Not surprisingly, Witte's criticism becomes most explicit in his discussions of Buber's use of terms such as Blut, Schicksal, Einheit, Volk. He castigates Buber for an insufficiently reflected use of German nationalist vocabulary. Witte is at his most critical of Buber, where Buber is at his most German, where he comes closest to Deutschtum, when he applies to Jews notions of chosenness that resonate with German exceptionalism, when he all too readily returns to Germany after the Holocaust, when he engages in conciliatory conversations with Heidegger, but most of all when, in 1914, Buber enthusiastically joins the Germans' Kriegsbegeisterung, the enthusiasm for the war. In these passages, Witte interrupts his composed scholarly doctors with expressions of outrage and dismay. Quoting Buber's call for heroic self-sacrifice for the German nation, Witte comments, solche Sätze können heute nur noch mit Bestürzung und Abscheu gelesen werden. Such sentences can today only be read with consternation and disgust at the seductibility, the verführbarkeit of the intellectual. And Witte continues, the worst of it is the unreflected identification of the Jew with German war efforts and the immeasurable hubris to consider himself called to lead the way. Yet it is precisely in these emotional passages that one most strongly senses that Witte is indeed conducting a dialogue with the dead. While it was not difficult for me to go along with many of Witte's critical judgments, I occasionally objected to his black and white descriptions of a German idolatrous cult of beauty, which he opposed to the Jews' peace-loving ethics. His occasional identification of Judaism and Christianity in the context of his critique of paganism. His overt, uh, overly romantic celebration of Jewish exile and diasporic existence, and maybe of things Jewish altogether and his stereotypical invocation of the book and the letter as the Jew's portable homeland. I pointed out to him that he repeatedly quotes only the first half of God's instruction to Abraham to leave his fatherland in Lech Lecha. I also challenged the important Witte assigned to the death in Walter Benjamin's writings. I objected that this was a Christian mode. I quoted Benjamin, who in a letter to Christian Rang formulated the sentence that is particularly dear to me. It seems unlikely to me that from a Jewish point of view, the Torah can be understood as a mystification of death rather than an affirmation of life. So Benjamin writes, dass von irgendeinem jüdischen Standpunkt aus der Torah sich eher als ein Sterbensmysterium denn als eine Lebensbürgschaft fassen lässt. It was with great satisfaction that I saw traces of his change of mind in one of his later books. In one of the important passages that draw a contrast between Homer and Moses, Witte describes the Greek epics as, quote, filled with Mord, Krieg und Tod, and portrays the Jewish tradition by contrast as grundsätzlich auf die Überschreitung der Schranke des individuellen Todes auf das Leben, as fundamentally oriented at crossing the barrier of individual death at life. Allow me to end on a more cheerful, though not entirely unrelated anecdote. About 10 years ago, Witte and I were invited to a conference on the correspondence between Paul Celan and Ingeborg Bachmann at Syracuse University and to a subsequent event at the Austrian Cultural Institute in New York for the launch of their recently published collection of letters.
The Romanian Jewish poet whose parents were murdered by the Nazis and the Austrian poetess whose father was a Nazi had a brief and fraught love affair in Vienna in 1947 before Celan left to Paris. They continued to be in relation in a very complex uh, relationship and to write to each other for several decades. My talk in Syracuse focused on a letter and the poem Celan had written in response to Bachmann's continuous expression of a desire to reach over to him. Not yet, but I, I, I did I have no. I I had a photo, but it's not there anymore. Yeah, this one. Not yet. No, no, I don't. I will get there, but I leave it here. I had, a, I thought I had included a picture of Celan and Bachmann. Um, so, in Syracuse, I talked about a letter by Bachmann. No, a, uh, yes, a, by a, a letter and a poem Celan had written in response to Bachmann's continuous expression of her desire to reach over to him, to join his ranks. Celan interpreted these expressions, probably correctly, as her need to distinguish and distance herself from her familial origins and her wishful identification with the victims. In one of her letters, Bachmann describes their embrace mentioned in a poem Celan had sent her as exemplary. She must have sensed that Celan would not appreciate this and crossed out the word with black ink. But Celan held the letter against the light and reading the word must have interpreted this as a suggestion that Bachmann saw their individual embrace as a gesture of reconciliation, if it is exemplary, between Nazis and Jews. His acerbic reply, contains what may be the cruelest definition of love. And this is the quote. If I were not involved, Ceylan writes, how fascinating it would be and how fruitful to follow these moments of reaching beyond oneself on both sides. This dialectically heightened indistinctness of our realities, which have been fed with our blood, nonetheless. So to call love a dialectisches über sich hinausgreifen, was soll das überhaupt? But I'm involved, Inge, the letter continues, and so I do not have an eye for what, in that carefully crossed out, yet not completely illegible passage in one of your letters you call the exemplarity of our relationship. In response to Bachmann's desire to reach over to him, Celan writes a poem with the title Lob der Ferne, in praise of distance. The poem's central verse contains a poignant reply to Bachmann. Ich bin du, wenn ich ich bin. I am you, when I am I. To paraphrase, an I can only be a you for the other if it remains itself. Celan, who had read Buber, may have formulated here his own rejection of a unifying synthesis or symbiosis of I and thou. The verse containing stark paradox, uh, contains stark paradoxes typical of the early Zenal, and initially sounds close to Buber, but as the Zenal scholar James Leon points out, quote, these lines actually run diametrically counter to Buber's thinking. Identity, and consequently a form of unity with the Tao, can only be achieved if the poetic I is isolated and distanced from the Tao, since at this distance it does not sacrifice its I. Here Celan gives a reverse twist to an image inextricably linked to Buber's world of thought. For the conclusion of the conference in Syracuse, Bernd and I had agreed when we were asked to read a selection of letters from the correspondence. Shortly before the reading, and we did that again in the Austrian Cultural Center uh, of Fifth Avenue in New York, 
Shortly before the reading, we realized that we were not on the same page. It had been obvious to me that I would impersonate Ceylan and that Bernd would play Bachmann. Bernd had assumed the opposite. He insisted, I refused. He gave in reluctantly. I described the Wolf when I saw Bernd for the first time. In truth, he was present for me before I met him. As a college student, I wrote a paper on Ceylan's poem to his dead mother before a candle. In the essay, I quote an article by a certain Bernd Witte, whom I didn't know then, to illustrate my contention of the performative function of Ceylan's hermetic verses in this poem of commemoration. Ceylan's hermetic poem, I'm quoting Bernd Witte, challenges the reader to meditate in language. Seen in this way, poetry becomes, through its form, an instrument of meditation. So this was the very first sentence of Bernd that I heard or read. Witte stayed present after I last saw him. A few weeks ago in a course that I gave as visiting professor at Yale, a student objected to my assiduous attempt to uncover the hidden references to earlier texts, particularly to the Bible, in nearly every word of this very poem by Ceylan. She felt that my pursuit missed the, points, missed the poem's affective atmosphere of remembering the dead. I responded to her by invoking Bernd. She may not have noticed, I said, that what we had been busy with in this class was a form of meditation. Our seemingly philological activity was really a privileged moment spent not only in dialogue with the dead poet of these obscure verses, but in a state of commemorating the dead that Ceylan's poem remembers. Inwardly, I thanked Bernd for having provided me with a reply and for our dialogue that I then felt will extend well beyond his death. I sometimes think back on my objection to Bernd's desire to impersonate Ceylan, the son of Jewish victims rather than Ingeborg Bachmann, the daughter of a Nazi. Retrospectively, I wonder. Maybe I should have let him do this, or should at least have explained myself more gently. I cannot let him know this anymore. Neither this, nor that we are gathered here remembering his life's work. Nor that generations to come will gratefully engage with the Buber Werkausgabe, nor ask him whether he ever thought that he reached the dead he addressed. But that I cannot do this, too, is part of the dialogue with the dead.